Book Eight, The Last Day, Chapter Two, The Thirty First Day of Planting, Part One of One. There's only one recording for this chapter. In the morning, familiar shouting awakened Shin and thousands of other weary soldiers. For what? Thorn was roaring. Progressing only a few hundred paces up a mountain, that's not enough to earn a day of rest. Shin opened his eyes and rolled over to watch the drama play out below him. A nervous staff sergeant was delivering the news to Thorn that the army was under the impression they could sleep in. Well, wake them up, Thorn yelled. No one rests today. We're going to Salem now. Shin rolled on his back and smirked at the gray sky that was beginning to lighten. He listened to the groans and protests that rose all around him as sergeants roused themselves and bellowed for their men to get up. The frustrated refrain was being picked up and carried far to the east and west. Within 15 minutes, Shin predicted, since bad news always traveled faster than good, the entire army above the boulder line for miles in either direction would be furious at General Thorne for caving in to his officers. He was no leader at all. That morning, Mari reassured her daughter. I think a rushed wedding is the best idea. Everyone should do it this way, she decided, as she sliced loaf after loaf of bread in the brighter's kitchen for the impromptu meal afterward. You don't have to fret for six more weeks about preparing enough food. And no one needs to fuss about stocking their new house fully, since it will happen later, 17-year-old Susie added as she cut up a cake. Or arrange flowers, her 16-year-old sister Tabit said, putting the cake on plates. Not that there are any flowers. Or worry if we forgot to invite someone because we can now just say there wasn't time, 14-year-old Banu reminded them as she put the sliced bread in baskets. When you really look at it, Mari said, it all boils down to a young man, a young woman, and their rector. Nothing else really matters. Jaitsey tried to arrange some dried fruits artfully on a large plate and shrugged. You may have a point. I have been worrying about the food. And Lilla said she'd bring something over. Banu looked out the window. She's coming over now, Mama. Jaitsey peered out, too. When in the world did she find time to roast a wild turkey? Mari grinned. Oh, good, she did get it done. It's been baking all night, but she wasn't sure it would be ready on time. Jaitsey chuckled. Good old Lilla. Oh, there's the bride and her family. Four wagons just drove up to the barn. Mother, please tell me calla has got a turkey roasting, too. She does. There'll be plenty for sandwiches. Jaitsey wiped non-existent sweat off her brow. Oh, the sooner we get this over with, the better. Well, that's a terrible attitude about my son's wedding, I must say. We can't do anything until Uncle Shem comes back, Mama, Tabit reminded her. Don't worry, he won't miss this, Jaitsey said. He personally wants to make sure Zadok sees Vidro marry. Shem said Zadok may not remember what his duty is unless he witnesses it. Susie rolled her eyes. He's only 22. I don't know why everyone's pressuring him. You're absolutely right, Susie, Mari told her. Perrin and I were 28, and Shem was 36, after all. I don't know why he's in such a rush. Her voice trailed off. Because years ago there was time. But today, there was a rush. That's what I used to think, Mugga, Tabit said softly. I'm only 16, but since yesterday, I've been wondering if I'll ever have a wedding, rushed or unrushed, of my own. Susie, a year older, sat down hard on a chair and covered her face with her hands. What if they succeed? she whispered. I keep thinking they'll give up, but the banner is still flying. What if the army comes to Salem? Then they'll come, Mari said with conviction, and we'll go to the ancient site and wait it out. But I wanted to become a mama, Susie sobbed. 
Jetsy put her arms around her. Her heartbreaking but determined to cheer up her granddaughter, Mari said, Well, who says you won't? Susie looked up, her delicate features blotchy. How can I when it's the last day? The last day is the end, right? Her light brown eyes glowed in desperation. I mean, maybe I should be running outside looking for someone, anyone, to marry today, too. There are a couple of boys down the road. Maybe they're thinking the same thing. Zadok, Tabit cried. Susie, marry Zadok. Mari and Jatesy's mouths fell open at the turn of the conversation. I do know him well, Susie mused. He's attractive enough, but really obnoxious. Then again, Uncle Shem was supposedly like that, and he's mellowed over the years. Jatesy and Mari couldn't make a sound of protest because they were too stunned to even breathe. It's perfect, Tabit encouraged, considering there's not a lot of time left. I don't know, Banu said. I kind of pictured Zadok with someone more obnoxious like him, like Versa Thorn. She's not married anymore. They could be really interesting together. Tabit scoffed. Uh, Versa Thorn Zenas? That would bring General Thorn here. No, I think Susie should marry Zadok today. It's the most convenient. What are you saying? Deck's voice boomed throughout the kitchen, startling them all. It knocked Mari and Jatesy out of their stunned stupor, and they looked at Deck with relief that someone was there to shout some sense into the girls. Susie, you're not about to run off and get married just because just because you think this is the end, Deck declared. Behind him stood Lilla, holding the platter with the turkey on it, her face blanched at the conversation. Susie, Susie, she said, pushing past Deck to put the platter on the table. Don't worry, sweetie, the last isn't the end. True, we don't know what happens after the last day, but the Creator always rewards us with what we want and deserve. You want to be married and be a mama, and somehow you will. We don't know all the details, but I know the Creator loves you and won't deny you that privilege. Absolutely, Mari said, finally finding her voice. She's right, Susie, Jatesy said, smoothing her daughter's hair. She better be right, Deck growled, because any boy who wants to marry my girls has to go through me first, and I have a very lengthy waiting period. Just ask Luck. He had to wait almost 19 years before he earned my approval to marry Salima. Mari snorted. She didn't know if Deck was serious or not, but the moment shouldn't have been as tense as it was. They were preparing for a wedding, after all. Jatesy covered her mouth as she giggled. Lilla's face went red, suppressing her laugh as she watched Deck's stern glare start to soften. Susie finally giggled, as did her sisters. Nineteen years, Papa? That means I'll be thirty-six by the time I finally marry. Good! Deck said, as long as it's not today. An hour later, the orchard at the Shins was swarming with people. When Shem finally arrived on horseback, the crowd cheered. Sorry, Vidro and Autumn, he called, as he dismounted and kissed Vidro's eager bride on the cheek. For some reason, people in Salem are a bit panicky today and kept stopping me. I guess they didn't realize I was on my way to a wedding. Deck patted Shem on the back. Can't have a wedding without you, Shem. And if some panicked children of mine would have had their way, he lowered his voice. Another one of your sons would have been marrying another one of my daughters. Shem didn't look nearly as shocked as Deck expected. There's a lot of that going on today, he whispered. I just sent out my assistants with urgent messages for the rectors to not perform any marriages unless the couple was already engaged. And as much as I want to see Zadok married, pairing him with poor Susie or Tabit is not the way. Those girls deserve better. Actually, all girls deserve better. Zadok's just going to have to be my guard for the rest of his life. Deck chuckled. Guess there was no room for the message of no unplanned last-minute weddings on the towers? 
Shem didn't look at the message he had flying all over Salem. Emergency, guide Zenus, meeting, mid-afternoon, arena. What I have to remind Salemites about this afternoon may be much harder to take than the stoppage of any spontaneous marriages. Shem forced a smile. But let's not worry about any of that right now. I'm in the mood for cake. Deck glanced over at his son and future daughter-in-law, both of them beaming. Rector Shin, I believe everyone's here. Pato smiled and took his position between two peach trees as everyone else jostled for position to watch. But Mari stayed at the back, leaning against the large boulder carved with her husband's name. She could see well enough, and it didn't feel right being at a wedding without her husband. His body lay beneath her feet, but his spirit was inching closer. She could feel it. He was probably sitting on a boulder, much like this one, laughing at all of the out-of-shape soldiers trying to make their way to Salem. Come home to me, Perrin, she whispered. Mickey announced a few minutes ago that she and her husband Clyde are expecting their first baby in six moons. Come back to hold that newborn. Let another baby know all great Uncle Pugga. Please, please bring back young pair. The two of you are missing this. There they go, walking up to Pato. He just asked them if they're both there of their own desire. Vidro answered with a shaky but happy yes. And Autumn answered with, I've been waiting for this for over eight moons. It took the army of Idamia to scare him enough to stand in front of you. So yes, definitely yes. You'd like her, Perrin. She's full of fire. Vidra wanted to wait until the herd finished calving, although there's only a dozen expecting cows. But with the gray banners, Pato sang the words. They're answering. Now they're kissing. Tears filled her eyes. And another grandchild is married, without you by my side. She ran her hand along the boulder, feeling the words etched into the stone. Her finger slipped in the letters for husband. Or Perrin, if you can't come to me, let me come to you. Shin smiled smugly at the grumbling of the soldiers around him. There wasn't enough room for 20,000 men to make their way to the canyon, and in a crowd they felt anonymous enough to voice their frustrations. Shin suspected Thorne would soon be calling for him and his escorts to lead the way, but he wasn't about to make anything easier by showing himself. That would be his strategy, infuriatingly reluctant obedience. He slouched to avoid being the tallest of the soldiers, crammed for miles in the narrow passageway. Now, if only hammer and iron would make themselves a little less conspicuous. I mean, why change his mind? This is stupid. I feel like cattle being forced into a corral. What are we waiting for anyway? This should have been planned better. Why not just send a few hundred men to find the route, then get the rest of us? Slag, look. Here comes another batch of soldiers over the boulders. Hey, just stay there. Where do you think you're going to stand on top of me? If we could just have stayed resting on the mountainside like we were promised... Shin didn't even have to plant any seeds of traitorous talk. It was springing up all around him like weeds. In the Shin's crowded orchard, the midday wedding meal was being served when the tower chimes sounded. Pato and Shem caught each other's eyes between the apricot trees, then looked up at the tower. The men stationed there had hit the chimes softer than usual, trying not to disrupt the wedding celebration happening below, but the banners were changing. Gray banner, gray striped banner. Pato and Shem met each other among the pear trees. Some of the army are over the rock and heading into the canyon, but the rest are still on the boulder field, Pato explained. Shem shrugged that off. Still time for cake, Pato. It's Grandmother Pato's recipe. Mari and Calla spent all yesterday evening working on it, and I'm not about to miss cake, just because Lemuel wants to take a hike. Besides, there are enough things that will slow him down. 
Mari noticed the two men talking and turned to look at the towers. Over the noise and laughter, she didn't hear the chimes, but now she saw the banners. Keep them safe, Perrin. I'm waiting for you. General, this canyon isn't exactly the whitest. I don't think we can get more than three or four men abreast through here. At 80,000 men, that means it will take... Yes, thank you, Twig, Thorn snapped. From Edge, the canyon appeared to be very broad, but once they reached the mouth of it, the bottom half of the floor was occupied by a cold and swift river. Thorn stood at the opening of the canyon, with now 30,000 anxious men behind him, and more climbing the boulders every minute. I always wondered where this river came from, Healy commented as he watched it rushing past. They must take their horses along this narrow bank here. That can't be right, Thorn muttered. He looked up to the canyon walls, searching for another route. The sides rose up sharply, still covered in ash that had hardened into the same cement-like substance that rendered all of the farms in the world unusable. Wide patches of dirty snow and ice turned all of the terrain into an unfriendly gray mess. There must be another route that's wider and faster. Look for trails that have been cleared. Sir, one of the lieutenants called. He was crouched several paces ahead of the general. Sir, look at this! Hoof prints! Thorn walked over to peer at the impressions in the melting snow. How recent! Yesterday? And they go straight along this bank. He jogged for several paces and crouched again. Yes, here they are again, in the mud, heading up the canyon. Thorn smiled in triumph. There it is, he said confidently. This is where they would sit and spy on us. If I had a spyglass, I could probably see right into the command tower where Waynes is perched with his feet up on my desk and Slither is gorging himself on mead. We've found it, men, Thorn exclaimed. Twig and Healy exchanged cautiously relieved glances while only a handful of soldiers behind them cheered, probably not as enthusiastically as Thorn expected. So we don't need Shin after all? Healy asked. The lieutenant, still squatting at the bank, scratched his head. He looked in front of him and behind him, to the left, and then, absurdly, into the river. Thorn noticed. What is it? Ah, uh, sir, the tracks, they, they just stop. Stop? I can't see where they continue. It's as if the horses just vanished from this point on. Thorn turned to the body of soldiers. Have they found Beavit and his men yet? he asked, newly irritated. Down the crowded mountain there was a slight commotion moving to the mouth of the canyon. Several tall and large men were among them. The soldiers before the commotion weren't too interested in making room for the ten men to squeeze their way through, but with snarl at the lead, leering at soldiers left and right, and jabbing a few with a small knife, they eventually moved aside. Thorn watched intently as Private Shin came to the front of the line. Beavit had suggested earlier that perhaps the private would be so excited about going home that his eyes would inadvertently give away the direction to Salem. The private kept his gaze low, trying to squeeze through the press of men. When he saw the river flowing near Thorn, he tipped his head thoughtfully. Oh, I always wondered where that river came from. Sergeant Healy seemed to smirk. Is this the way you choose to go, sir? Shin asked simply, looking at the canyon walls. He gestured to a rocky outcropping high up. Could be an interesting view from there. Thorn glanced at the outcropping and scoffed. Ugh, and how would someone get up there, Shin? Shin shrugged. I'm betting Snarl could do it. Just a good workout, right, Snarl? Buddy and Pal were watching Shin's eyes closely, as did Snarl, just as Beavit had taught them. But nothing in the way Shin surveyed the mountainside revealed anything. His pupils and eyes didn't change whatsoever, nor did his gaze linger on anything. An exasperated sigh made everyone turn around. Amory stood there, having followed Beavid's group. Her hair was unkempt, her remaining face paint was smudged comically, and her clothing made it apparent that she'd slipped and fallen into the mud on more than one occasion. 
Wearily, she gazed up the canyon and leaned against a convenient soldier. Where's Guide Lannard? Thorne asked her. I thought you were going to stay with him, make sure he doesn't get lost. Uh, he's still back there, calling for blessings for those climbing the boulders. He's very inspiring, she said without any irony. She changed her position against the reluctant soldier. This is it, Lemuel. River seems to be running high, though. The soldier she leaned against shifted subtly. Amory's pack, seemingly heavier and larger than anyone else's, slipped backward as it unbalanced her. She firmed her stance and purposely looked past Shin. We need to head straight up this canyon. The glacial valley and the fort are at the top of it. How far? Thorne asked. Amory bit her lip. Uh, I've never been very good with distances, but maybe ten miles? Several soldiers behind her groaned. Shin's group watched him carefully. Something twitched near his eye, but other than that, he revealed nothing. Thorne turned to him. How far is it, Shin? The private shrugged. Your guess is as good as mine, sir. Thorne stepped closer to him. No, it's not, Shin. You've been here before. Now tell me, how far is it? Shin didn't move or speak, but looked past Thorne to the canyon. Answer me! Shin remained motionless. Lemuel, let's just start walking, Amory said. It doesn't matter how far it is, just know that this is the way. Every man should fill his water flasks here. I can't remember if there's water up at the glacial valley or not. And the route we followed leaves the river and goes up the mountainside somewhere. Shin's eyes wandered up the canyon and looked over to the right, analyzing the slope. Buddy, Pal, and Snarl noticed. So did Thorn. So we start walking, he said with a curt nod. But first, we need to cross the river. Amory's mouth dropped open. Lemuel, why? Because that's where the trail is, on the other side. No, no, Amory protested. I'm fairly confident it was on this side of the canyon. It went back a ways, then switched back and forth up the mountain. Thorn evaluated the terrain Amory waved vaguely at. It was nothing but hardened ash, snow, and ice. I don't see a trail. You're not supposed to see it from here. You have to you have to go up some part, she said, walking a few paces and searching the ground for a hint of where to go. Look for tracks. Thorn rolled his eyes. You told me yourself you were unsure of the distance or direction. It was raining most of the time you were traveling, and I've yet to meet a woman who was good with directions. Amory blew out in disgust. Ugh! Who are you going to believe, Lemuel, me or him? He's not exactly eager to help you if you hadn't noticed. She jerked her thumb irately at Shin, who was studying the opposite canyon wall. Shin shifted his gaze to Amory, then looked around innocently to see if she was indicating someone else. Healy smirked and looked down at his boots. Thorne took several quick steps to come within inches of Amory's face. I trust his lies more than I trust your judgment, my love. You don't know which way is east even when the sun is rising. He turned to Twig and Healy. Start with 50 soldiers on that side of the river searching for a trail. Send another 50 up this side of the river to find any hidden trails. In 15 minutes, we start walking in some direction before the rest of the army creates a log jam behind us. Shin, how do we cross the river? Shin shrugged. Bridge? There's no bridge, Shin. Stepping stones? The river seems to be running high, Shin. I see no stepping stones. Wade across? It's cold, Shin. Well, I'm out of ideas. Then again, that's why I'm only a private. A few soldiers behind him sniggered. Thorne stepped up to him again, aware that he had an attentive audience. Cross that river, Shin, and find me the route or you will die without ever seeing Salem again. Amory clenched her fists. Lemuel, we're going to need him. Trust me, this is the easy part. The confusing part comes when we leave the glacial valley. Thorn leered. We may possibly need him. 
Abruptly, he reached over, grabbed one of Beavid's team called Cloudman, and yanked him to a side. Cloudman's eyes grew large, but then he blinked and smiled, as if he was expecting to get a medal for bravery. But I don't need this one, Thorn shut Cloudman's arm. The rest of Cloudman jiggled too, just for fun. So Shin, if you don't cross that river, your little Gracina friend's journey ends here. Thorn nodded to one of his personal guards, and the man drew his sword. Cloudman continued to grin at the attention he was receiving, oblivious to the sword pointed at his chest. Ends here, he said. But I don't mind going up the canyon, sir. I'm guessing the view of the clouds from the top must be good. For the first time, Private Shin's expression shifted from vacant to livid. He clenched a fist and nodded to Cloudman. You'll see the clouds from the top, I promise, Cloudy. With a glare intended to stab Thorn, Shin started for the riverbank, suddenly interested in it. Thorn turned to Twig. Fifty men over there now, he bellowed and nodded to the left. Fifty more men follow over here. Shin, start thinking or start swimming. Private Shin began to fume. He had to confess to himself that one part of him had found the past couple of days turning into an intriguing game, something one might see acted out on the stage. Just how far could he push Thorn with his feigned naivete, and how much would Thorn push back? But now Thorn had thrown in a new player's token by using an innocent vile head as a hostage. The game was over. Shin paced along the riverbank, clenching his fists furiously while trying to think of how to get across. He hadn't expected Thorn would force him to find a route. He was just hoping to confuse the general, not take a frigid bath. He looked around at the trees, and an idea came to him. Cloudman, let me borrow your knife again. Cloudman stepped past the guard's blade pointed at his chest and eagerly handed over his knife. Thorn stepped forward, too, and caught Cloudman's wrist. Exactly what do you plan to do, Shin? Make a bridge, sir, he answered coldly. Don't worry. If I try to do anything stupid with the knife, I'm sure you'll see to it that Cloudman sees the clouds up close and in an instant. And 80,000 men will have a piece of me. Thorn reluctantly let him take the knife. He turned to the trees, analyzing the dead timbers before making his selection. Then he crouched and stabbed the long knife into the ground at the base of a dead tree, sardonically imagining Lemuel Thorn as the roots. He severed the roots all around, just as his father had weakened the trees above the fort at Edge. It really was quite easy, and he could see why Pedro Shin had been able to knock down hundreds of trees a few moons ago by dislodging a boulder upon them. Shin didn't have a boulder, but he had two blacksmiths. He stood up, grimly satisfied with his work. Hammer, iron, need a little push here. The two blacksmiths walked over to the tree and shoved. It turned out he didn't need such hulking men. The dead tree crashed down and spanned the river with such little effort, even Amory could have done it simply by leaning against it. Several men cheered, but Shin was already working on the tree next to it, stabbing angrily. He was partly pleased that the strategy had worked, but more annoyed that Lemuel Thorne was still ordering him around and succeeding. The smiths readily toppled the second dead tree. Shin stood up. There's your bridge, sir, he said dully. I recommend only one man go across at a time and put a foot on each log. Those trees can't be too strong since they were so easily compromised. Perhaps only lighter men should go across. Hammer and Iron took two large steps backward. Thorn lifted his chin. Go first, Shin. Demonstrate just how strong the bridge is. Beavit stepped up to the general. Sir, is that wise? Just letting him run off like that? Thorn smiled thinly. If the logs aren't strong enough to bear his weight, Shin takes another bath. If they are, you'll be second across and can chase him down if he runs. Besides, there aren't a lot of places for him to go now, are there? Beavid's mouth twitched, and he nodded at Shin. 
The private began to hand the knife back to Cloudman, but hesitated. Just right there, only an arm thrust away, was Thorn's chest. How quickly could Shin stab him? And how quickly his guards would take Shin out if he missed Thorn's minuscule heart? Cloudman put an end to Shin's fantasizing by taking his knife out of his hands. Sheathing his weapon, Cloudman said, Think light, floaty thoughts, private. Another opportunity missed, Shin thought to himself, as he stared longingly at Cloudman's knife. But then the idea of stabbing Thorn seemed to wipe itself away, as if it never really wanted to be in his mind, as if his mind knew he was all talk and no action, especially when it came to openly defying Thorn. Why didn't he do it? Act as brave as he pretended to be and stand up to Lemuel. Thorn tipped his head toward Shin's makeshift bridge, and his guard raised his sword up to Cloudman's chest again. Cloudman, oblivious of the threat to his life, grinned and gestured grandly for Shin to venture across the river. That was why. It wasn't just Shin's life at stake. For you, Shin said to Cloudman, only you. Shin stepped first on one log, then the other. They rolled and shifted slightly, but were close enough together that their remaining limbs intertwined to stabilize them. He had done this dozens of times, and far more dangerous situations, but for some reason he felt nervous as he hesitantly crept over the rushing river. The daring streak that accompanied him his entire life had vanished sometime in the past year, replaced by a strong sense of self-preservation. It was an odd sensation. Was this how everyone felt all of the time? Was this why he didn't try to stab Thorn? The logs bowed slightly as he reached the middle, twelve paces from either side. When he reached the far side, he exhaled and turned around, trying not to dwell on the fact that he'd have to go back again the same way. Beavid rubbed his cheeks. Half wished you'd failed, Shin. I'm not looking forward to this. He took a tentative step onto the logs. Focus on one leg, then the next, Shin suggested, almost feeling badly that the staff sergeant had to follow him. He seemed to be a decent man. Beavid was growing strangely rigid. Maybe he was experiencing that self-preservation twinge as well. And keep moving! Beva took his first steps and froze. What's wrong? Shin called to him. Just how cold is the water? Freezing. Couldn't I just wait across? You're not afraid of the water? No. Then why are you afraid of crossing? I'm not really sure, Shin. Then crouch and crawl across. Crawl? It'll be faster than standing there. Crawl. Right. Beavid got down on his hands and knees, straddling the two logs. How is this better? Now I'm closer to the water. It's a shorter distance to fall, Shin pointed out. Is that what you're afraid of? Falling? Would you get moving already? Thorn bellowed at his sergeant. Beavid shook slightly and started in a panicked crawl across the logs, dodging the branches sticking up. In a few moments, he was on the other side. Shin greeted him with a grin. Good job. I promise going back will be a lot easier. Going back, Beavid said, trembling. Soon enough, thought Shin, or maybe in a long while, they'd discover that there was no route to Salem on this side of the river. I'm next, Cloudman announced eagerly. It'll be like floating over the world. He stepped out confidently on the logs and made his way easily over to Shin and Beavid. Even Thorn seemed surprised at his speed. Reg, Buddy, and Pal came over next, but Teach refused. Someone has to stay and keep Hammer and Iron Company over here. Here, take that skinny thing over there. He looks like he could use a dunking. High above the canyon floor, four men in gray model clothing laid on a rock outcropping and watched the procession try to cross the river far below them. They chuckled quietly as one man, then another, fell into the rushing water and were fished out by soldiers downstream. They also kept careful watch on the second group of men, starting to make their way up the canyon wall where they were perched. 
At their rate, it'd take them an hour to reach their position. The trail was still there, but so well camouflaged by the hardened ash that unless the sun was shining on it just right, it was nearly impossible to discern. Still, someone, sometime, surely would discover it. One of the men took out the spyglass and focused on the tall soldier who first went across the river. He smiled in satisfaction. What do you think they're doing? One of the scouts whispered, mystified. Why cross the river? Why not? asked the scout with a spyglass. Because it would be a waste of time, for one thing. Ah, you're thinking like a Salemite. So is he. The man with the spyglass chuckled. The world isn't going to trust anyone, even those they should. Amory has been gesturing wildly in the correct direction, but Thorn is instead listening to someone else. Who? Send another message to guide Zenas. Young parent Shin sighted and doing all he can to aggravate General Thorn. They just might discover the Eastern Sea before they find a way to Salem. Shem didn't notice how quickly the arena was filling because of the long line of people trying to catch a few moments with him. But the arena was packed long before mid-afternoon. For those living too far to send someone for the update, 150 scribes sat in the first three rows, ready to write down all of the guide's words. When he finished, they'd compare notes, make corrections, then get those copies to young men on fast horses. They would deliver the messages to every tower and rector, and in the dissenter villages, bring the message to the elected or self-appointed leaders. Even the northernmost communities and the three dissenter villages would have the guide's warnings and advice by dinner. Everyone in the arena knew why they were there, the gray banners flying ominously over Salem. The army of Idumea was coming, albeit slowly. When Guide Zenas took the stand, having gently pushed away those clamoring for his attention, the tens of thousands of gathered people hushed in anticipation. My beloved Salemites, you've seen the banners and the scouts have confirmed it. The army of Idumea is attempting to find Salem. The crowd broke out in nervous whispers. Why they're coming, Shem continued, and the whispers died immediately. I'm not entirely sure. But I know that their reserves are dangerously low, and they're becoming desperate for food and farmable land. Once they lay eyes on Salem, they'll decide they found their salvation. They'll covet our homes, our animals, and our lands. They will not, however, care one bit about your lives. As long as you live, they'll see you as a threat. But if you're dead, then all that you have stewardship over becomes theirs for the taking. I cannot stress enough how important it is that should the army be successful in this attempt to reach Salem, you and your families leave immediately for the ancient temple site. No delays. This is what we've been preparing for for years. Now those years of preparation will pay off. When you see the black banner with the white sword on the tower near your homes, That's your signal to gather your family and your emergency packs which you've been faithfully repacking every year. And if you haven't repacked them, today would be a good day to do so. I've already contacted all of the rectors to make sure the storehouses remain open throughout the evening. The crowd's nervous murmuring swelled to a constant hum. Guide Zenas paused to let the hum quiet again and to let the scribes catch up in their frantic writing. A voice near the front called, Guide, what if we fight them off? Defend our lands. Why should we just let them take it all? Guide Zenas held his breath as many more calls of, Let us defend ourselves, rose up in the arena. Several of his twelve assistants, seated on chairs to the sides of the podium, looked around, startled at the sudden aggressiveness of the Salemites. But Shem wasn't surprised. He had long suspected this would happen. Salem had never before faced a direct threat, nor did they know how to deal with the idea of someone simply taking something. That never happened in Salem, so the natural impulse was to fight back. But the Creator expected more from Salem. Guide Zenas leaned forward and said loudly, No! 
the arena fell into silent befuddlement. He let his answer settle in before continuing. I know your desire is not to allow anyone to take your homes, but this is not the Creator's will. Nor, you will remember, are these your homes or your farms or your livestock. All of it belongs to the Creator as it always has. It is His will that you voluntarily leave Salem and retreat to safety. We've known this would be our fate for the past 165 years. Ever since Guide Pack saw this time coming, this shouldn't be a surprise. We also know that Guide Glee saw that no weapons of any kind should be taken. He couldn't complete a sentence for the outcry that arose. No weapons was the only phrase he could distinguish before the din grew too loud. Many were demanding to be armed, while many others were just as adamantly reminding him that that was against the prophecy. Another voice near the front shouted, But what if this isn't the last day? What if it's just a preliminary attack? What if we have to rebuild once they leave or we destroy them? Shem sighed. He'd hesitated making any declaration that the last day was near or around the corner, as Mari had begged him to know just that morning. He didn't feel that was his announcement to make. But as he watched tens of thousands of Salemites, who he'd always known to be a peaceful and obedient people, suddenly become agitated and even irate, he knew it was because of the spirit that preceded the army of Idumea. The refuser's influence was already there, stirring up those whose faith wasn't quite as strong. Shem said a silent prayer, asking if, The answer came too forcefully to deny, and he had to grip the podium to remain upright. Staring down at his notes, he could no longer find his place, because the words he needed to say were repeating in his head and would continue until he spoke them. He swallowed hard and said, The last day is coming. It will be upon us shortly, very shortly. He didn't shout or raise his voice, yet the feeling of his words carried over the entire arena and stopped every tongue. The sudden silence was profound. Just to be sure they heard him correctly, Guide Zena said in the same clear voice, The last day is coming. It will be upon us shortly, very shortly. Defending ourselves is contrary to the Creator's will. If we follow the admonitions of our past guides, we will be preserved to see the hand of the Creator fight this battle for us. But, he continued in a sharper tone, if we insist on fighting, we will fall before the army. What's the point of losing your lives, trying to keep a house or preserve a farm? The ancient temple site is and will remain a secure site. Should any danger approach it, I have full confidence the Creator will send a way to secure it again. He has promised us, through the words of many guides, that He'll fight our battle. The Deliverer will come before the Creator's Destroyer. I think we've all heard that before, haven't we? Before Him on the benches, thousands of men, women, and children squirmed worriedly, restlessly. My dear Salemites, I've been in battle. It's not romantic, nor heroic. It's terrifying, tragic, painful. If the Creator says He will do my fighting for me, then I happily accept His offer. Each of you would be wise to do so as well. A man rose to his feet. And what if we don't? What if we choose to fight instead? Then you fight alone, Shem warned him. Now, I'll do nothing to prevent you. Salem is still a free land. You may choose what you'll do, but I promise now that those who stay to fight the army will die. You simply cannot win. Idumeans are more powerful and more desperate, and they care nothing for anyone's lives but their own. The Creator will not help you, because if you choose to fight, you choose against His will, and you forfeit His protection. There was considerably more squirming in his audience. But I also promise, he changed his tone yet again, 
that if you follow the word to the guides, if you go with your families to the ancient site, you will be in the Creator's care. I'm not advising you to surrender to Lemuel Thorne. I'm advising you to surrender your will to the Creator. Let Him finish this for us. He thought it would be enough, that the choice was obvious. But apparently, several hundred Salemites, mostly men, didn't agree. One stood up and yelled, All those who wish to fight, meet me out by the West Greens and we'll discuss strategy. Shem hung his head in frustration as a few hundred men took to their feet and marched out. Shem was true to his word and said nothing, nor did he call out for any of them to be detained. Instead, he shook his head and studied the podium in front of him. Strategy? What did these people, who hadn't faced a real threat in over five generations, know about strategy? Shem eyed the man in the lead, waving encouragingly for others to follow him. He had frequently attended Eltana Jordan's armchair general's meetings. Since Perrin died, she had taken over the meeting where Salemites who served for a time as scouts in the army of Idumea gathered to rehash their good old days with selective memories and too much confidence. Their abilities would never match their bravado. Shem knew about strategy, but he'd never volunteer information contrary to their creator's will. He closed his eyes, offered another quick prayer, then looked up at the congregation. The last of the men had filed out, and now everyone turned to see what the guide would say next. Their apprehension radiated up to him, surrounding him, trying to douse him in cold and nervous sweat. Even the most faithful and confident Salemites looked desperate to be reassured just one more time. Fleeing was the correct option, right? Shem calmly asked, Anyone else wish to join them? The congregation was silent. Then spread the word to your families, your neighbors, and everyone you see. Prepare for the coming of the army of Idumea and for the saving by the Creator. Be in the right place at the right time. I, for one, will be standing by the ancient temple site on the last day, whenever that may be. I pray every Salemite will be standing with me. We may have very little time, so I will keep you no longer. Go home, get ready, and watch the banner towers. May the Creator be with us all. He turned and strode off the platform, hoping his sudden movement and abrupt ending, he didn't even lead them in a hymn or a final prayer, would startle the crowd into action. He heard thousands of people standing up, talking, hopefully filing out of the arena without delay. Perhaps for the very last time. That thought nearly stopped him in his tracks. He'd been speaking from that stage for decades. But was that really the last time he'd address all of Salem? It was all over, just like that? He couldn't linger on that gloomy thought, because at the bottom of the stairs stood Calla, wringing her hands in worry. That went well, didn't it? She said miserably. Shem tried to smile. Of course it did, my love. I expected some resistance. Already a mass of semi-panicked people were rushing to speak to him, and while he had nothing more to say, he would try to comfort them. Someone was pushing through the crowd, shoving people left and right, probably because elbows were involved. Curious and worried as to who was so determined to reach him, Shem was startled when suddenly Mari burst through the press and rushed up to him. I knew it, she cried cheerfully, and threw wide her arms to hug him. Unsure of why, he indulged her. She jumped a little and planted a kiss on his startled cheek. I knew it! Thank you, Shem! Murray turned and disappeared into the crowd, squealing in delight. Now, that response, he said to his wife, I did not expect. But you should have, Calla said. You just confirmed that her husband's coming home. When Shin set up his camp that night, it was in full view of his log bridge. The army had progressed exactly 400 paces. After extensive explorations that lasted many hours longer than the initial 15 minutes Thorne had called for, no path was found. 
on either side of the mountains. Then again, Salemites didn't make paths like the world thought they would. No signs with pointing arrows, no carefully carved steps, not even logs bordering the edges. Thorne finally declared that in the morning they'd make their own path. Most of the men were now cutting into the sides of the canyon wall with hatchets or long knives, trying to fashion a reasonably comfortable place to sleep. Very few were succeeding. Shin heard the grumbling and complaints up and down and all around. He laid back in smug satisfaction. True, Thorne had forced Shin and a few others across the river, but Thorne was no closer to Salem. A full day wasted, and his army was growing irritated with his lack of progress. Shin counted today as a solid win, and guiltily knew he was seeing this as a game once more. But this was no game, and sooner rather than later, the army would get to Salem. And then what? What could Shin do to preserve Salem, or to stop Thorn, or shift the army's loyalty? As if you have the power to do any of that, but you don't have to, young pair. I keep telling you, we already have a plan. Wearily, Shin looked up again at the clear, cold sky. There was one thing he did know. It was another perfect night for sleeping under the stars. Guide, I'm sorry to come to you so late, but... But nothing. You know that I want updates whenever they come, Shem assured the messenger as he led him into his dark gathering room. Kala lit a candle and brought it in. The messenger looked at her and hesitated. You can speak in front of her, Shem assured him. She'd hear it from me as soon as you left anyway. The messenger shrugged. Woodson recommends changing the banners to striped gray. The majority of the army is in the canyon mouth now, or trying to be, and Thorne seems determined to go on despite not finding any trails. Shem exhaled, and Calla gripped his arm. How far up the canyon did they make it today? she asked. Not far at all, the messenger told her. It seems they have a soldier at the lead who's not very helpful. He had Thorne send a portion of his army across the river to find a route on the other side of the canyon. The other side? Shem exclaimed. Any fool could see that's a much more hazardous way. Callus smiled. Maybe that fool knew that and was trying to delay Thorn. Shem smiled as well. Was it young Pear? The messenger nodded. It was. He even felled the trees to make a bridge the same way Rector Shen had felled the trees last year to destroy the forest above the fort. Shem's jaw dropped. He knows, doesn't he? He knows it was Pato. Kala tightened her grip. Should we tell Lilla? Not yet. I don't want Lilla to hope he'll return, only to have her spirits dashed. If young Pear pushes Thorn too far, Kala groaned in reluctant agreement. Today's still the 31st day, right? Shem said. It will be the 32nd in less than an hour, Kala said. Shem thought for a moment. Return to the second resting station tonight, he said to the messenger. At first light, change the banners to gray striped, and he took a deep breath before continuing, fly the black flag with the white sword for region one. Kala gasped. The messenger nodded soberly. The army would reach them first, Shem said, so they should be the first to leave. I want the south emptied by tomorrow afternoon. I'll send a notice in the morning that the northern areas and dissenter colonies should begin preparations too, since they have the furthest to go. We'll fly the sword banners there by midday meal. Oh, Shem, Kella whispered. He put his arm around her. This is what we've prepared for, Kella. It'll be fine. Thorn may still give up, turn around, and head back to Edge. It just, it just seems so sudden. The gray banner has been flying for two days, Kala. I know, I know. It's just that after all this preparation and time, it just doesn't seem real that it's actually happening. Shem pulled her close. It's happening. Mari was right. It's right around the corner. And that's the end 
of that chapter, chapter 2, the 31st day of planting, there was only one part to this chapter. Thank you.